<laughs> now we're looking at the relief model of the area of Lockbur and the first thing that's striking us is the shape of the lake. And first of all we identify our position. This is the interpretive centre as represented here. So from here we're looking up the lake, up this east-west leg of the lake. As you came along here today, perhaps you saw the other leg of down here. And identifying things from here, the first thing we see here is number 24, which is Bowling Island, Cranova, and say here, trees. The old old Cranovas, man made island. Yeah. And the hill on our right as we look out is Knock Fennel. And on top of Knock Fennel, number 27, there is an Iron Age green burial, an Iron Age burial mound. And there are many forms of burial that have cropped up during excavation of the This particular one on the top of Knock Fennel, the bodies are crouched in a folded position. They were subjected to some degree of heat without being cremated. And the contraction of the tendons <coughs> results in this crouching position. In the cis grave, which you have seen a moment over there, in the cis grave, very often there was no connection and they had to break, actually break bones to get the body into the position. Even the not final one, that wasn't so. On the side of the hill here, number 26 is the Red Cellar Cave, which is just an ordinary limestone cave with no great consequence, except just during excavation the remains of a brown bear were found in it. And that is not really unusual because the brown bear is only extinct for the past thousand years. If you've been to the Aylwe Caves, you will see the, the tall marks of bears in the, in the beds, the, just the tall marks on the stone, you know? So that's 26. There's a, a stone fort, the remains of a stone fort, on the other shoulder of, on the east, on the western shoulder of Knock Fennel also. And that was, is probably contemporary with the stone fort of Carrigal, which are over here in those three. And here we have an excellent, excellent example of stone fort in the area. Um, when I went to Carrigal, I can refer you to those two models on there. See those two? Yeah. And if I just move over there, you see you have the wall, which is made of stone, complete stone cut stone as such, and this stood to a height of roughly about seven feet or so. And possibly on top of that there might have been a palisade. Now the entrance is interesting because these people were farmers and using the bits to accommodate their cattle as well as themselves. Half the passageway in is paved. That's for humans. And the other half is for as well as that, you have a bit of originality again coming into it. They recessed the gate posts or the gate holes. So when the gates opened up by the they there weren't an obstruction to anybody. It in so into the walls. The lake itself is, covers 187 acres. Prior to 1847, this area here was also lake. And then in an attempt to provide famine relief. There was a channel dug here in this corner, in the northwest corner, going down beside the church in Grange down onto the road. And that dropped the water level by roughly seven feet and created a bog here. And all around the lake road, <coughs> there were found immense amounts of artifacts of all sorts, both in the copper and the stone. So much so as I said, that people came along with horses and carts just to ship the stuff. The way up here. And there are things from the Upper and every museum in Western Europe and beyond. The local girl was coming home from Bangladesh where she'd been doing a, a year's nursing on the relief of her. They came back over them and uh, they called it the Museum of Tehran. And the first thing she saw was like, the first cascade she looked into was a stone axe from Lock Or. These are the things which she bought. But it thrills from time to time. 
the first people to come <coughs> were the Neolithic people, and they had an ideal situation in picking the southern face of Nakaluga. Now remember that name, this was an island. Right? The whole area here was an island. 65 acres of limestone hill with very, very little tree growth. And the rest of Ireland at that time was practically growing. So here they found an ideal place to set facing south and they built their houses. And this, <coughs> these buildings are reconstructions of the type of house which they built. Much more sophisticated than that they've done. Now that is what represents a much better type of house which was excavated and reconstructed in after the by Professor Sean Burry. You know? But at least this thing is catching the same effect. We're speaking about the uh, terms used between posts to create walls on the foundation of just a layer of stones. And no chimney or possibly a whole roof. Fire located in the centre of the floor. Very simple. Now, if you've seen the crack hole, <coughs> you should have a look at Carry out. Have you seen Greg from Carry out? No. Now, on Carry out and Bowling Island, because the Craig and Owen project is based on these two. This is the work of John Hunt, later John Hunt did many, many years just about here. He starts to sit over in that work. He spent a lot of his time. He built the castle, of course, and Craig and Owen. Now, he based the ring fort, stone fort on Carrigas, and I had no doubt in my mind that this is his Cranoe uh, on Bowling Island. The castles in Knockar, here we have Bowling's Castle. Again, bringing you back to the thing, this is the island, Knockadoon and Island, defended by two castles, Bowling's Castle here and Black Castle over here. Two causeways going to and then you have a sort of impregnable mass of land. Bowser's Castle is described as being 15th century. <coughs> that castle is technically <coughs> And the third castle, Garrett Castle here in um, Garrett Island, is also 13th century. Bowser's was under siege in 1641 from Candlemas Day until the 2nd of February until the middle of almost the end of July. 24 weeks of siege. And during that time, there were 240 occupants in the castle. And 80 of those were killed. The people who were attacking the castle decided that the best that they just couldn't get across here normally, so they got a boat out from Limerick and they crossed the lake, they crossed the hill, and they set up a cannon on the top of the hill to attack the castle. And in doing that, they killed quite a lot of women and children who were out gathering herbs and plants on the hills. There's a fascinating story of endurance on, on the, the part of the people who were attending the castle. And then when they finally surrendered, they, they marched as far as Yall, and the man who was in charge of the castle was a man called Weeks. The Weeks family still live here, that hero there, and obviously Weeks family. And when they got to Yall, he wrote a verbatim account of all the scenes of the whole happening. And that is collected in the Sloan manuscripts. It's uncorrected. And there's plenty of bad grammar and bad spelling and lack of punctuation and all that. It gives, a, it gives a true account of the happenings in the number Possibly the most important site of all is the Great Stone Circle of Rage. Now, if we relate for a moment to the people who came, first of all, the Neolithic people came. And they <coughs> came across southern Europe and came across here from either Spain or France. Not too sure. But they were joined later by the, the Beaker folk. Now, it, 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 to identify the, the Neolithic man who came here, we're talking about quite small, long haired people from southern Europe. Are you yourself? Are you a long to the round to person? I mean, it's very simple, you know, you take your measurement from there to there and from there to there. And in the migration of tribes across Europe, 
after the last ice age. In the north, you had the two islands, or the northern peoples. And these people were quite tall and fair haired, blue eyed, and long haired. Being the bishop. Across central Europe came the Alpine people. Brown haired and round haired peoples. And along the Mediterranean shores, you had came along the Mediterranean tribal race of people. And these were small, long headed, fair haired. And we are all descended someplace along the line from one of those. Groups. First people being the Neolithic, the Mediterranean long heads. The second tribal people coming to the upper were the Beaker folk, and they came around 2000 BC. The overlap now into the Bronze Age. And they were a mixture of, of Nordic and Alpine. And in excavation here, the heads of long headed and round headed people have been found buried in the same burials. And this has led to the belief that there was the sort of cohabitators had to be in peace with them. There was no war or strife between them. Which were, may or may not be true, because in the construction of the great stone circle here in Grange, excavation has revealed that on the western bank there was obviously a camp which was a camp which lasted for five or six or seven or eight years because of the, the turf layers, you know. And in the camp there was an awful lot of coarse wear found, like that over there on the shelf. Undecorated wear, you know, simple type wear. That is referred to as knock, knock, knock or type, knock a doom, pottery. Simple undecorated stuff. Whereas around the, the artifacts of the standing stones, there was quite an, a lot of beaker wear from. And it, it might be fair to infer that the beaker folk came along and they imposed their will on the existing people so that the natives did the work of construction as directed by the, the invaders or the newcomers of the beaker people. So there we have Neolithic man, we have Beaker folk influence, moving into the Bronze Age, and again in relation to the to the Celts when they came along. We move now to the next age, the, the Iron Age, starting around 500 or so. The Celts have left their mark here in Lockhart also. The large standing stone there, you can see the big one down there in the range, that one, the tall stone, yeah, is called Ronach Hondo. And uh, Crumdo was one of the Celtic gods. Ronald Crumdo is possibly the, the portion belonging to Crumdo, if it's it the meaning of it. In other words, Crumdo was the god of the area at one particular time, during early Celtic times. And in the field adjoining that, not marked here, this field here, there's a stone called Cluckabilla. And Cluckabilla means the, the stone of the sacred tree. And the Celts had sacred trees and they had sacred waters and so on. And they marked the position of the tree with a stone. And maybe on that tree they might have grown mistletoe and before they cut the mistletoe in the late autumn of the year they always sacrificed white bulls to their gods. Um, relating to the same period, 36 on to 2, number 2 here is the site of the negative. Giant's grave there, this one, the second one. And there's a better representation over there. Now, in these giant's graves or megaliths, the bodies were cremated, generally. In the gallery grave, wedge shaped gallery grave here, number two, there were, I think, 12 remains found. Eight of those had been cremated, and four were inhumed. In the case of cremation and in the burying of chiefs in that time, it would be the very, very same possibly as went on in Greece. And Homer in his Iliad recorded the burial of Patrocles and the burial of Hector. And we must take a link on these two things because, um, first of all, death and sorrow, which is typical. Then this was followed by cremation. And this gave a speedy release to, to, to the spirit. Inhumation 
body was put into the grave and left there. And the, the thinking of that at that time was that until the body had decayed, the spirit wasn't released. So by cremation, the spirit was immediately released. As soon as that was done, the ashes were gathered up and placed in something like those pottery vessels over there, placed in the larger chamber of the megalith. And then the whole thing was closed up for the moment and a tube was split over it. And this was an amount of stone, possibly covered with, with soil and top. And then the celebrations took place. The job was done. It was time for joy then. Festivities took place, sport took place, games took place. All part of it. And life went on as life does. How are we on time? We're just a few more things about the lake itself. Um, I 187 acres. If you want, if you travel from this point here below the interpretive centre, right up to the corner here, you will cover one straight mile. If you walk around it, you cover about four and a half miles. Walking, just walking the circumference, but that is quite difficult. There is a little worm inside. A small flat worm, very distinct chap. Certainly of interest to the botanist. Um, and he is found in Lockdoor and no other lake in the British Islands. Um, now, that poses the question, how did he get him, you know? And the answer is, I suppose, readily in the fact that the first people who came to Lockdoor came over sea from Spain or France. And no doubt, this little chappy came along with him. There can be no other explanation for it, you know? The Ice Age didn't go down that far, come up that far, so he came certainly with people. Got his way into the lake and has remained here since. And he's almost a protected species at this stage, if you mention doing something to the lake. Because the lake is not in very good health. As you can see, when you look out the window there, there's a huge growth of weed. And that growth of weed decays and builds up a mass of about two inches of mud each year. The old people around here will tell you that there's no problem. Well, here, between Ash Point and Ockfennel, you can get roughly 15 feet of depth. Come over here to this side of it, and you can get an average of five to six feet of depth. And that's all. And underneath that, you have 20 feet of mud in the And this process is just a suicidal process. Nature of work, filling up, and killing itself, literally. But apart from all the mud and all that, down below the bottom of the lake, <coughs> there lives Garodi or the third or the desert. You're listening to me. Yes, yes. Because this is the great folk tale of Lockhart. But historically, the man shouldn't be just left go into folklore because historically he was quite an important man in his own day. He lived from 1338 until 1398. And as well as being Earl of Desmond, he was Lord Chief Justice for Ireland during the period of the Statutes from Kenny, 1367. And um, he made a very definite attempt to, to found a university in Ireland. And there wasn't any university in Ireland at the time. But he dabbled in magic, we are told, and it's when the time of death came, he was not allowed to die, the same as ordinary mortals, he was condemned. He's his castles and retainers down to the bottom of the lake. And there he is. Still. Once every seven years, it could be today, like tomorrow, but generally in the month of August, he rides his white horse around the margin of the lake. And when the silver shoes are worn completely, then he will restore the fortunes of Desmond. Now that's a nice story as it relates to Loch Gore, but the same story as you all possibly know relates to many other places as well. In Germany, they say the same with Frederick Barbarossa, in Killarney, the Lord of the O'Donoghue's lives in the same fashion. Up in the Burn, Lady Incha Quinn has somewhat the same powers. Of course, our man here in Loch is Gerald Eula, third Earl of Desmond. 1338 to 1398. I think we're under pressure of time, right? Look.
Gerber, with its protective arms enfolding a rocky hill, commanding a panoramic and strategic view of the surrounding countryside, is a natural place to settle. Now, the hunter and survivor follow the animals here. For 5,000 years, extending from the Stone Age, man has lived, hunted, fought, and died here. Behind him, man left an indelible print on time. Drawing its name from the Irish Loch Gair, or Narrow Lake, the limestone ridge area around the lake is punctuated by the milestones of history. Fed by springs and drained by a subterranean channel, Loch Gair's level was lowered in the last century when a new outlet was cut. The discovery of a rich hoard of artifacts when the lake was lowered strongly indicates that the water level was much the same as it is now in the mist-shrouded eras of Stone Age and Bronze Age man. That the lofty hill of Nokadun was at one time an island is evidenced by the sighting of two castles dating from the Middle Ages at each end of the hill. The man-made sentinels are Black Castle on the southern end, which is a 13th century vintage, while to the north is Buncher's Castle, which is dated a century later, but scholars believe it may have been a reconstruction of an earlier castle. The lowering of the lake level a century ago revealed a newly exposed bed of La Gur as a treasure chest of history. While wood and leather work from the hands of ancient Irish man had perished, the lake gave up hundreds of Stone Age axes, dozens of Bronze Age weapons, and many other finds. The most famous of these is the Loch Gur Shield, a circular bronze shield now in the National Museum of Ireland. These finds and the abundance of field monuments around the lake confirmed Loch Gur as one of the richest sites in the country. Prehistoric man came to Loch Gur 5,000 years ago. The lake and its surroundings offered protection and sustenance. From Loch Adun, he could observe his surroundings and any risks or threats. And the lake drew the wildlife of lake, air and forest which man hunted. <laughs> Here too, the rich pasture land roundabout enabled man to rear his own stock and till the land. For his hunting, building and domestic life, Stone Age man fashioned his own implements from the flint found in the limestone of the area. The hard flintstone he shaped into axes, spears, knives, blades and other useful implements. Many examples of these flint weapons and implements have been excavated, plus the pottery which Stone Age man made. Pottery found in Loch Gur was made locally and can be compared with pottery from other sites in the country, so indicating that the settlement at Loch Gur had communication and relations with the rest of the country. <laughs> Neolithic man made large burial tombs for his dead. In these tombs, known as megalithics, were interred the remains of the chief or headman of the settlement. The type of grave found at Loch Gur is called a gallery grave and is constructed of large boulders of local limestone. The tomb was covered by a mound of stones, but passing time and the elements have bared the chambers. Because such tombs were reserved for important members of the Stone Age community, the number of such sites around Loch Gur suggests that the settlement there was large and well organized. Loch Gur's Stone Age community built homes of mud 
covered with thatch roofs supported upon wooden posts. Remains of their rectangular and circular houses are barely visible. The wheel of time and evolution saw the transition from stone implements to metal as the Bronze Age dawned in Ireland around 2000 BC. This progress is mirrored at Loch Gur. Mingling copper with tin, man forged the daggers, spears, axes and shields which have been found in profusion around this lake. In this era, burial practices too changed. Internment took place in stone-lined graves known as cysts, which were hidden below the surface. In some cases, the dead were cremated and their remaining bones were placed in urns and buried. Among Loch Gur's many monuments and remains, the Greystone Circle is the most impressive and intriguing. This huge stone circle was built by the people who brought knowledge of metalwork to Loch Gur. These people were known as the Beaker Folk because of their distinctively decorated pottery. The great stone circle was erected around the beginning of the Bronze Age. The circle consists of massive stones rising up to eight feet out of the ground with an outer bank of turbs. The circle is thought to have ceremonial significance, typical of many stone circles which is related to the Midsummer Solstice. Directly opposite the entrance on the eastern side are two large stones. Through these, the sun shines on the solstice. Who knows what awesome or secret rituals were practiced here by Bronze Age man. A similar monument is at Circle P. Their dwellings included crannos. These were artificially constructed islands on which wooden houses were bounded by a wickerwork palisade coated with mud. Smoke from the fire escaped through a hole in the thatch, and the safety of the island home was reached by boat or bridge structure. A reconstruction of a crano, which were in use in Ireland up to the Middle Ages, is featured at Craganown in County Clare. The remains of a Cranog are found at Bowen Island at Loch Gur. Many of the sites around this lake belong to the early Christian period, such as the stone forts of Carrigal. These were habitation sites enclosed by stone walls with elaborate stone entrances. natural resources and strategic amenities remained an area of settlement right through the Christian period and down through the ages to modern times. The pagan mysticism of the Bronze Age was replaced by Christianity. Not far from Loch Gur, the Arda chalice treasure was discovered, while the sighting of a church close to the lake testifies to the presence of a settlement in the area. The lands around Loch Gur were granted to the Anglo-Norman Fitzgerald family, who later became the Earls of Desmond. The area was bound to this family for the 400 years up to the late 16th century, when they rebelled against English royal authority and were wiped out. Their castles and great houses were confiscated and the Earl of Desmond was tracked down and killed in Kerry in 1583. Kerouad Island in Loch is the site of one of the Desmond castles, 
Legend says that the Earl Garrod once lived here, and every seven years his spirit is reputed to walk the placid waters of the lake. circles which decorated ancient Irish art and brooches, and even writing, continues to turn. Today, Lochgar is tranquil and quiet, but man has made his mark here, and in the solemn eeriness of a place where men have walked and talked, hunted and loved for 5,000 years, the past is always present. 